Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our our mouth mouth filled filled with with laughter, laughter, and our our tongue with shouts of joy. Then Then they said said among among the nations, nations, the Lord Lord has done done great things things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart and get up. He is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of the nations, help us recognize and understand that there are perspectives and experiences outside our own, and help us recognize that every experience is valid and that you are in each one. Amen. As I was praying with these texts this week, the gospel turned out to be a difficult one. (laughs) The psalmist, however, was praying to God, asking God to return things back to the way that they were when they were great. Now that, that resonated. (laughs) They're asking God to give them back the glory days when Zion was on top and the other nations were jealous of the success of Zion. So clearly things aren't so great for the psalmist at the moment as he's crying out to God saying, please give me back our fortune. So does the psalmist's words sound familiar at all? (laughs) Do they resonate? Do you resonate with the theme that most mainline Christian churches portray? That's us, by the way. We're mainline. This idea that things were better before today, and that we are praying to God to restore them to how they were before. But the major problem with the psalms is that They're individual prayers. They're prayers from one perspective. And in this case, they are prayers from someone who grew up in a time where Zion was thriving, when their people were the envy of the world. But in this psalmist's lifetime, they found themselves in a period of drought, 
where their successes have all but dried up. And I can't help but relate this sentiment sentiment to what I hear today. That the church is dying, but it was great and good before. But that there's just one problem, I think, with that thinking, with that ideology. It only takes into account one perspective. The perspective of the person who experienced the successes and the downturn from those previous successes. It neglects the people who weren't successful during that time. The people who envied Zion were the mainline churches. And also neglects those who have never known anything different. Are there people in this world who've never known success? And it's always just trying to survive. See, I was born in the year 1992. I can, I can feel you all thinking, what was I doing in 92? <laughs> but what that means is I never experienced the quote-unquote heyday of mainline Christianity. I heard about these great Luther leagues, whatever that was. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I heard about it. I read about it. I never experienced a whole town centralized around a church. I've heard that happened. <laughs> that was never my experience. I never experienced these movements that drew in crowds of young people and youth and you were busting out the door with young people. I never experienced that. I don't know anything other than today. And this idea of wanting to restore the treasures of yesterday, it doesn't resonate with me. And it especially doesn't resonate with the youth of today. The stuff that was special and worthwhile in the past just isn't worthwhile and special to new generations. And I know that's hard to hear. I'm going to have to realize that eventually, too, that what I used to hold dear doesn't matter to the new generation. It's hard to hear. It is. And I'm not trying to say that one perspective is right or wrong or that we shouldn't hold what was dear to our hearts. That's not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to say that we shouldn't be like the psalmist and focus so narrowly on the fortunes that we as individuals had. That we should open our minds and our hearts and our eyes to see that there were people suffering in the midst of our successes. And that there are people thriving right now in the midst of what we think is a decline. We need to start focusing on the fortunes that we have now. Because there are many. There are. And the fortunes that we could be having. I'm optimistic. I hope you are too. We also need to try and remember that our past fortunes does not mean that every person had fortunes back then, as I've been saying. Going back only a hundred years, a hundred years. We can see that the Lutheran Church, I'm not going to speak for other churches, the Lutheran Church was not a place of fortune for LGBTQ people. It was not a place of fortune for indigenous people. It was not a place of fortune for people of color. And I'm not here to blame us for living in the time periods that we were. That I, I'm not here to, to criticize and condemn those 100 years ago. But it's important that we recognize that we grow and we learn and we become better Christians over time. 
And that maybe what we did 100 years ago, what we thought 100 years ago, what we thought 10 years ago, could have been wrong. The fortunes of the past may be our fortunes, but they are not universal. Just like today, it is important that we see that those like us who feel like our fortunes might be dwindling, there are others who are thriving. There are mega churches out there who have thousands of people attending, preaching the same word that we preach. And I think it's important to remember this feeling. This feeling of being an underdog. The feeling of not being on top. The feeling of envy or maybe disappointment or maybe even discouragement. I don't mean to bring it down this Sunday. But I do, I do think it's important that we talk about it, recognize it, and learn from it. Because if or when we do retain our fortunes, we don't forget about those who aren't thriving. We don't forget about the people who feel like us today. See, the disciples, they were living in their fortune. They were with God incarnate. People were coming from everywhere, wanting to be with Jesus. It was exciting. It was awesome. Jesus was healing people. Hooray! But there was this blind man who wanted some of that fortune. But the crowd quickly dismissed them, him. Why? Because in the midst of glory, it's easy to just push those you don't really want in your, in your circle away. But Jesus, <laughs> he quickly dismissed them and said, bring him here. And he joined this man into his fortune. And that's what we are called to do today. To share in the fortune that Christ has provided us. As I said, we do have many fortunes. If we only have the gospel, we have much. If we truly believe that we are trying to create a community centered around love of neighbor, around everyone. We have much. To be radical in our acceptance and proclamation of the love of Christ, that is what we need. That is all we need. And the rest will come. To accept those that the world doesn't want to accept, that is our call and that is our fortune. That's what makes us different. Being exclusive is easy. Being radically inclusive, that's hard. But you know what? I never understood why being radically accepting of all people was so controversial. I never understood that. I never understood how saying yes to God became secondary to saying yes to our own wants and desires and prejudices and understandings of the world. I never understood how trying to lift up people the world puts down, like LGBTQ people, people of color, indigenous people, immigrants. Why is that controversial? I don't know why. Jesus says, stop, bring them to me. So why can't we? Jesus Christ, the God that we worship, is the God that ate with prostitutes, probably drug dealers, Murderers, people the world hated and called them friend. 
for life. That was the Jewish understanding. If you ate with someone, you were friends with them and called them family for life. And Jesus like, give them to me. So why can't we? Jesus made it his mission to love those the world went out of their way to hate. And not just in simple acts of kindness, but in bold, radical moves that shook the religious and political landscape of the time. Jesus is radical. We put Jesus in a box, tidied him up. We, we, have, we have crucifixes that don't have blood or the agony on his face. We've cleaned up God. Jesus is radical, and I believe the church has forgotten that. We've forgotten one of our most exciting and life-giving aspects of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. People don't die for a faith that isn't radical. You don't. I would not die for something I didn't truly believe. Or that someone would even want to kill me over. People are not crucified for their beliefs if they are not radical. People don't have a faith dedicated to their service that lasts 2,000 years. If it didn't shake up a few feathers here and there. So we have a choice to make. To look in the past and pray that maybe one day things might return to how they were and hope that our box stays the same. Or we can be radical and say to God, give us everything you got. Bring it on. And we'll do it for you today. Help us be the fortune for others in today's world that you are for us. A fortune for those who didn't get a chance to experience the fortune of the past. And maybe we can create a community where everyone can share in the fortune. And I cannot do this by myself. I need each and every one of you to believe this truly. That we can do this. That we can create a community that is so radically accepting that people hate us. And I'd love to be hated for loving people. I'd love it. <laughs> I hope you would too. Jesus was never about the status quo, ever. Jesus came to change the world to be so radically accepting, so radically loving, that people hated his guts. People don't hate people who don't change the world. Jesus is a change maker. So let us be disciples that we're called to be. Disciples of this divine change maker. And only then will we find our fortune again. Amen. Amen, brother.
Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.